American engineers created a machine designed specifically for war, but destined in the coming years to touch the lives of everyone. That machine was the computer. In 1946, this was the only working electronic computer in the entire world. Few people had heard of it. Fewer still regarded it as anything special. Yet in less than two decades, computers would number in the thousands. Rooms full of clerks would be replaced by these lightning-fast machines. In a few short years, computers would change forever the way the world did business. And in so doing, become one of the largest and most powerful industries on Earth. Few people could imagine a market for more than a half dozen computers in the entire world. The creators of ENIAC, J. Presper Eckert and John Mockley, believed the computer would command a greater destiny, serving not only science, but business as well. The first one was that the machine was made out of large numbers of vacuum tubes. ENIAC, with its 18,000 vacuum tubes, was the size of a small house, and in today's money it cost three million dollars to build. With that modest sum in hand, Presper Eckert and John Mockley launched the world's first commercial computer company. They named their computer UNIVAC, for Universal Automatic Computer. Within a few months, Eckert and Mockley realized they had vastly underestimated the time and money. Meanwhile, 3,500 miles away in London, Britain's computer industry was also just beginning. This would turn out to be one of the most unusual episodes in computer history. To learn how, they made a deal with Cambridge University, whose own work on a computer called EDSAC was well underway. In 1951, three years after they made the deal with Cambridge, the Lions Company completed its computer. They called it the Lions Electronic Office, appropriately nicknamed Leo. Leo was soon put to work processing the Lions Company payroll. On February 1st, 1950, Presper Eckert and John Mockley sold their firm to Remington Rand by then one of the largest business machine companies in the world. Remington Rand sold a variety of products, including typewriters, filing cabinets, and punched card tabulating machines. But within a year, the name UNIVAC would be on the lips of millions of Americans, thanks to a brilliant public relations move by Remington Rand. IBM finally took its first steps into the computer age with a production line of 20 scientific computers. The year was 1951, five years after Eckert and Mockley had started their UNIVAC. That delay would come to haunt Tom Watson, Jr. For while IBM was building its scientific computer, UNIVAC was slowly stealing away IBM's commercial customers. This so infuriated the younger Watson that he vowed to focus all his energy beating UNIVAC. And this time, he was free to lead the charge. After 40 years at the helm, Thomas Watson Sr. stepped aside, putting his son Tom in charge of the company. IBM's fate was now in Tom Watson Jr.'s hands. Watson introduced one of IBM's first business computers in 1953. At first glance, it was no match for UNIVAC. The IBM 650 was slow and inefficient, but it did have one big advantage. IBM's sales force, the company's greatest asset, and the envy of IBM's competitors. Computers costing thousands of dollars a month would sit idle while programmers struggled with the arcane language that computers understand. We BPX to 10D, AOR 10... Well, this AOR gets us into a BSN 11. Don't we want a BSN 12 instead? Unfortunately, computers cannot execute programs written in English. They require a special language of their own. Those and ones of binary code make it perfectly suited to computers that operate with thousands of electrical switches. In binary, the number one represents a switch that is turned on, and the number zero represents a switch that is turned off. 
But what works well for computers does not work well for human beings. Three, one can see that it's incredibly difficult to write that kind of thing accurately. In the first place, it's tedious to write it, and in the second place, it's almost impossible to do it correctly. Impossible because most programs were thousands of lines long, millions of zeros and ones. Programmers labored long and tedious hours trying to create programs, often to find they just didn't work. Then they spent even more tedious hours trying to find their errors. As had been predicted, this was not a job that attracted many people. The shortage of programmers could, could be used by scientists and mathematicians and was much easier to program in because it allowed them to write equations in the way they were used to. Fortran was great for scientists and mathematicians, but it was almost no use to business users who needed their own language, one that could handle letters as well as numbers and could process files of data. For that, you needed COBOL, which stands for Common Business Oriented Language. COBOL was very English oriented. That is to say, you wrote the programs in a language which was certainly not identical to English, but at least looked... ...changed the nature of people's work. And some jobs were eliminated. But these were prosperous times in America. The fear of computers replacing human workers would slowly subside as employment continued to rise. This Air Force computer alone used 55,000 vacuum tubes. And tubes were at the heart of every radio. An electronics newest marvel, television. But the vacuum tube boom was about to come to an abrupt end. Thanks to a tiny electronic component that some have called the most important invention of the 20th century, the transistor. most people, the transistor meant small portable radios. But this tiny component was beginning to change the entire field of electronics, thanks to its inventors, Walter Bratton, John Bardeen, and William Shockley. In 1956, just eight years after their groundbreaking work, Bratton, Bardeen, and Shockley received the Nobel Prize. But they were only dreams on a piece of paper. Such computers could never be built, simply because so many components could not be wired together. This wiring nightmare became known as the tyranny of numbers, and until it was solved, all progress was blocked. The tyranny of numbers soon became the most important problem in the field of electronics. Every engineer wanted to solve it. Finally, two engineers independently came up with a solution to this problem. The first was Jack Kilby, an engineer at Texas Instruments in Texas. The second was Robert Noyce of Fairchild in California. At Fairchild Semiconductor, Robert Noyce worked out the first manufacturable IC, or integrated circuit. And this is what it looked like. Essentially, it is just one piece of silicon. The cone-shaped structures are transistors that were made by chemically altering small sections of the piece of silicon. Other areas of the silicon were altered to create other electronic components. Then to wire everything together, a layer of metal was evaporated on top of the structure. With the invention of the integrated circuit, the tyranny of numbers, the tedious hand wiring of electronic components had been solved because the wiring was now part of the manufacturing process. As an added bonus, the circuitry of a whole board could now be reduced to the size of a fingernail. Both Texas Instruments and Fairchild announced the integrated circuit in 1959. But surprisingly, electronics firms were not interested in buying this new marble. For some, the integrated circuit was just too radical a change. But for most, it was just too expensive. 
for two years, ICs lay virtually unused by the electronics establishment. Then, almost overnight, world events changed the future of the integrated circuit. This is the BBC Home Service. Here is the news. Moscow is waiting to give a hero's welcome to the world's first spaceman, Major Gagarin of the Soviet Air Force. Major Gagarin... In 1961, the orbital flight of cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin stunned the world. In the midst of the Cold War, this Soviet success raised the specter of Russian domination in space. Facing sharp criticism at home and embarrassment abroad, President Kennedy issued a remarkable challenge to the nation's scientific community. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. The challenge of sending a man to the moon fell to NASA's scientists who quickly realized that a spaceship would need to have its own computer on board to enter and leave the lunar orbit. But how could they put a computer into a spacecraft that could barely fit three astronauts? Even transistorized computers weighed more than a ton and contained miles of wire. In addition, they had to be carefully protected from heat and vibration, hardly devices to be put aboard a spaceship. NASA scientists knew a small, lightweight computer could only be built from integrated circuits and they were willing to pay any price. Working around the clock to meet the needs of both NASA and the military, electronics firms discovered the true genius of the integrated circuit. Unlike the old hand-wired transistor circuits, ICs could be mass-produced. In 1960, the first integrated circuit cost $1,000 and had fewer than 10 transistors. During the next 10 years, ICs underwent enormous change. Every year, the number of components on an integrated circuit doubled. Within a decade, the cost of an IC had dropped to pennies, while the power had increased a thousandfold. Eight years after John Kennedy's challenge, NASA's onboard computer, built from integrated circuits, was completed. For its power, it was the smallest computer in the world. Seventy-two hours after blastoff, the tiny onboard computer would take over, guiding the Apollo 11 lunar module into the moon's orbit. The success of the mission and the lives of its astronauts depended on this small computer. It was the ultimate test of the integrated circuit's reliability. Now they were on their own, their fate resting on the ability of the onboard computer to ease them into orbit. This remarkable achievement was celebrated by millions of Americans. Steve Wozniak and his partner Steve Jobs, children of the Woodstock generation, would help write the next chapter of the computer revolution, putting the power of the computer into the hands of millions of people.